biased. Uncovering the Hidden Prejudice that Shapes What We See, Think, and Do by Jennifer L. Eberhardt. Chapter 1. Seeing Each Other. I spent the first 12 years of my life in Cleveland, Ohio, in an all-black world. My family, my neighbors, my teachers, my classmates, my friends, every person that I had any meaningful contact with until that point was black. So when my parents announced that we were moving to a nearly all-white suburb called Beechwood, I was excited about living in a bigger house, but worried about how I would be greeted by my new middle school classmates. I was worried they would make fun of me. My brown skin, my wiry hair, my large dark eyes. I worried about my way of speaking, my cadence, my word choice, my voice. Yet when I arrived that fall, white students went out of their way to welcome me. They introduced themselves, they invited me to eat with them at lunch, they showed me around the school and loaded me up with details on the dithering away array of activities now open to me. It was what my parents had always dreamed of. I could sing in a choir or act in a play. I could study sign language or learn gymnastics. I could try out for the volleyball team or run for a seat on the student council. My classmates seemed genuinely interested in helping me transition to this new place, and I was grateful. Yet I struggled to make new friends. I'd call students the wrong name, walk past a classmate in the hall without speaking, fail to remember the girl I'd shared a lunch table with in the cafeteria the day before. They didn't seem to hold it against me. They understood that I was meeting people every day and it was a lot to take in, but I knew that there was something more going on. Every day I was confronted with a mass of white faces that I could not distinguish from one another. I didn't know how to do it or even where to start. I'd had no practice recognizing white faces. They all looked alike to me. I could describe in detail the face of the black woman I happened to pass in a shopping mall, but I could not pick out from a crowd the white girl who sat next to me in English class every single day. I found myself constantly seduced by the easiest way to sort people. I would hold on to the fact that a girl in the red sweater said this and the girl in the gray sweatshirt said that. This helped me to keep track of a conversation in the moment, but I would be at a loss again the very next day. I tried training myself to pay attention to features that I'd never needed to notice in my black neighborhood. Eye color, various shades of blonde hair, freckles. I tried remembering the most distinctive features about each person I encountered, but all the faces would ultimately blend together again in my mind. As time went on, I worried that my new friends would begin to drift away. Who would want to be friends with a girl who had to be reminded to whom she was talking to from one day to the next? Stripped of this most basic skill, I became a different person in my new neighborhood. Awkward, uncertain, hesitant, withdrawn. I was afraid of making a mistake or embarrassing myself or hurting the feelings of people I'd grown to like. By springtime, whenever I saw girls whispering amongst themselves, I'd wonder whether their patience was finally wearing thin. Are they talking about me? I'd sidle over to try and join the conversation, but they'd fall silent whenever I showed up. I was relieved when one of the popular girls invited me to lunch at a restaurant one weekend. When I walked in, she was sitting at a table with a group of girls I didn't recognize until they all yelled out, happy birthday. I scanned their faces and realized that these were the classmates I'd seen whispering in the hall, planning a surprise party for the new girl who still hadn't managed to get their names right. They'd brought gifts and reflected that reflected touchstones in their life, including albums by mu musicians I'd never heard of, Bruce Springsteen, Billy Joel. I was moved beyond words by the gesture. No one had ever planned a surprise party for me. But when we finished the cake, hugged goodbye, and parted ways, I was still not confident that I could tell those faces apart. The irony of that school year always troubled me. I worried about being ostracized because I wasn't one of them, but I was the one stumbling over our racial differences. They wanted to connect and so did I, but I had suddenly acquired a deficiency that they were not aware of and that I did not understand. Decades later, I would realize that I was not alone. The science of recognition. For nearly 50 years, scientists have been documenting the fact that people are much better at recognizing faces of their own race than faces of other race. A finding dubbed the other race effect. It is a universal phenomenon, and it shows up in different racial groups all across the United States and in countries all over the world. It appears early and intensifies over time. By the time babies are three months old, their brains react more strongly to faces of their own race than to faces of people unlike them. That race-selective response only grows stronger as children move into adolescence, which suggests it is driven, in part, by the circumstances of our lives. We learn what's important the faces we see every day, and over time our brains build a preference for those faces at the expense of the skills needed to recognize other less relevant faces. That experience-driven evolution of face perception skills remodel our brains so that they can operate more efficiently. Scientists see the other race effect as a sign that our perceptive powers are shaped by what we see. That cringeworthy expression, they all look alike, has long been considered the province of the bigot, but it is actually a function of biology and exposure. Our brains are better at processing faces that evoke a sense of familiarity. I struggled to recognize my white classmates' faces because all the black faces 
were all I'd been routinely exposed to in the 12 years before I'd moved to the suburbs. My adolescent brain took time to catch up to the new world I was navigating, but I would soon develop new skills to function in their world. Race is not a pure dividing line. Line. Children who are adopted by parents of a different race do not ex exhibit the classic other race effect. For example, researchers in Belgium found that white children were better at recognizing white faces than Asian faces, but Chinese and Vietnamese children who'd been adopted by white families were equally good at recognizing white and Asian faces. Asian familiarity with various age groups can also be factors. In England, a study of primary school teachers found that they were better at recognizing the faces of random 8 to 11 year olds than were college students who spent the most of their time around other college students. And scientists in Italy found that maternity ward nurses were better at telling infants apart by looking at their faces than they were people from other professions. A proficiency that helps to ensure mix-ups don't happen in nursery, the researchers suggest. Our experience in the world our experience in the world seep into our brain over time, and without our awareness, they conspire to reshape the workings of our mind. Imagining race. I couldn't have known back in middle school that my own brain development played a part in my struggle to connect, but I was convinced that skin color had a role in the disassociation I felt. That's ultimately what drew me to the field of social psychology. It offered the perspective I needed to address a fundamental question to my own adolescent experience. How does race shape who we are and how we experience the world? The question is the starting point of bigger questions about identity, power, and privilege that have molded our country and roiled the world for centuries. Today, I am a professor and a researcher at Stanford University, a campus nestled in Silicon Valley, the heart of the startup economy, and a magnet for bright, energetic youth eager to tap the rich vein of technology for scientific solutions to social problems. When I arrived at Stanford, I was enticed by the tools of neuroscience research and began exploring the ways that race might influence basic brain, brain functioning. The brain is not a hardwired machine. It is a malleable organ that responds to the environment we are placed in and the challenges we face. The view of this brain runs counter to what most of us learned in science class. In fact, the whole idea of neuroplasticity runs counter to what scientists believe to be true about our brains for centuries. Only recent advances in neuroscience have allowed us to peek inside the brain and track its adaptation over time. Slowly, we're beginning to understand the many ways the brain can be altered by experience. For example, in the last several decades, we have learned that when someone is, be someone becomes blind, the occipital lobe, typically dedicated to processing visual stimuli, can dedicate itself instead to processing other types of stimuli, including sound and touch. When someone has a stroke, they might be able to learn to speak again despite massive damage to specific areas of the temporal lobe that are dedicated to processing language. We don't know yet the extent of this neuroplasticity, and some of the most intriguing lessons come not only from studying damaged brains, but also from watching people with normal brain function acquire usual skills, unusual skills. Researchers have shown that something as simple as driving a taxi can offer lessons in how basic practice and repetition can retrain our brains to function differently. In 2000, not long after I arrived at Stanford, a team led by Professor Eleanor McGuire published a paper that caused quite a stir in the neuroscience community. They'd scanned the brains of land London cab drivers in an effort to examine how the hippocampus, a horseshoe-shaped structure in the medial temporal lobe, might grow in response to demands placed upon it by the taxiing experience of driving through the London city streets day in and day out. Maguire's team found that the brains of taxi cab drivers, who had by necessity learned the structural layout of more than 25,000 London streets, showed significant differences in the hippocampus, the part of the brain that plays a critical role in spatial memory and navigation. The taxi driver's navigational expertise was associated with n increased gray matter. They had enlarged posterior hippocampal regions in comparison with a control group of people who didn't drive cabs for a living. In fact, the longer the drivers had been on the job and the more experience they had, the larger their posterior hippocampus. I found all this remarkable because it seemed to show not only how powerful our experiences must be to fundamentally change our brain, but also how swiftly the transformation can take place. In the case of taxi drivers, developing a deep structural knowledge of their environment forced a striking structural change in their brains, and that change happened not over hundreds of thousands of years, but within a few years of an individual's life. Individual expertise, as it turns out, has its own neurobiological signature. That revelation led me to pose another question, driven by both scientific curiosity and my and personal memories of my own adolescent lapse. Because our experiences in the world are reflect, reflected in our brains, might our expertise in recognizing faces of our own race and failing to recognize those of others display it in their neurobiological signature as well? Neuroscientists were originally skeptical about the prospect of race having an influence on something as basic, ancient, and important 
as how faces register in our brains. The act of perceiving faces is both critical and complicated, which might be why the task is distributed among multiple areas of the osseopotorempal region stretching across two of the four major lobes of the brain. The superior temporal sulcus, a trench-like structure in the temporal lobe that's vital to social competence, helps us to read the many different expressions that can suddenly emerge on someone's face, signaling us to approach, to smile, to share, to flee, or to quickly arm ourselves. A region known as the fusiform face area, buried deep near the base of our brain, helps us distinguish the familiar from the unfamiliar, friend from foe. The fusiform face area, known as the FFA, is widely thought to be both primitive and fundamental to our survival as a species. Affiliation is a basic human need. Without the ability to track the identity of those around us, we are left alone, vulnerable, and exposed. The FFA has been studied extensively, yet despite decades of research, there has been little attention paid to whether race might influence FFA functioning. From the narrow perspective of our brain science, the primary function of the FFA is to detect faces. Race, most scientists felt, should have nothing to do with that. Against that backdrop, I began working with a team of Stanford neurosciences who have specialized in human memory to look further into that matter. Together, we recruited dozens of white and black volunteers and subjected them to functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, scans that allowed us to track the blood flow changes in the brain that illustrate neural activity. As is common, our study participants had giant coils wrapped around their heads to transmit the images. We slid them through a tube-like scanner, a giant magnet actually, and showed them a series of faces of black and white strangers. We monitored the process from a control room nearby, taking the whole brain pictures as each face appeared before their eyes. The stronger the response to the face, the more oxygen flooded the targeted part of their brain and the brighter our measuring sensor signed. By tracking the activation of FFA over multiple displays of strangers' faces, we found that the FFA was responding more vigorously to faces that were the same race as a study participant. That finding held true for both the black and white people we scanned. We also found that the more dramatic the FFA response was to a specific face, the more likely the study participants were able to recognize that stranger's face when they were shown the photograph again later, outside the scanner. Ours was the first neuroimaging study to demonstrate that there is a neural component to the same race advantage in the face recognition process. It offered support for the emerging notion that the brain tunes itself to our experiences as we move through life. And we learned that race can serve as a powerful interpretive lens in that tuning process. Race, as it turns out, could exert influence over one of our brain's most basic functions. The FFA, with its bright colors on our imaging scans, provided us with a clear picture of how in and how out group distinctions set in motion by our relationships in the world among, around us are mapped out into the inner workings of our brains, the purse snatchers. Call it scientific progress or street, streetwise knowledge, but what took me decades to learn about the role of face, race in face recognition turned out to be common knowledge among an opportunistic band of young men on a crime spree in Oakland. It was 2014 and I had begun analyzing racial disparities in policing with the Oakland Police Department when the story made its rounds. Despite a substantial decline in crime across the city, the shopping district in Chinatown had registered an alarming rise of strong arm robberies. Apparently, black teenage boys were roaming the streets, snatching the purses of middle-aged Asian women. The police developed leads, made arrests, and even recovered some stolen property, but the cases fell apart before the suspects could be prosecuted, because even if a victim had seen the robber's face as he grabbed her purse and ran, none of the women could pick the culprits out of a police lineup. We could make stops on the suspect, called um, Captain Lerone Armstrong from the police department, yet the victim could not ID. Absent the idea, you couldn't charge the case. This made it impossible to prosecute. As the young man began to figure out that Asian women couldn't tell them apart, it turned into a license to steal, Armstrong explained to me years later after some crimes were solved and the robbers who were bound for jail confessed the details. When we'd ask, why do you focus in on this particular woman? They'd say to, say to us very openly, the Asian people can't ID. They just can't tell brothers apart. They tell us, like, this is our dream. That's why we go. There was a clear pattern to whom the teens targeted and where and how they struck. They focused on a neighborhood crowded with female middle-aged Chinese shoppers. They approached from behind, grabbed the purses, and fled, so the victims didn't have much time to study their faces. And sure enough, Armstrong said, in nearly 80% of the cases tracked by Oakland police, Jesus, the um, Asian victims could not identify the young men who robbed them. Black women, on the other hand, could identify the black robbery suspects as, at a much higher rate, even after a mere glance. The challenges of cross-racial identification are well known to law enforcement officials as they are to science. 
Research and real life experience have shown that the chance of false alarms of identifying someone as a culprit who is not goes way up when the suspect is of a different race than the victim. That's when the practical fallout of the other race affects. Oakland investigators worked to minimize the possibility of misidentification. They followed scientific guidelines on how to construct and, and use lineups with textbook precision. They even tried offering the victims training, directing them to focus on anything at all that was distinctive. Armstrong told me, was his skin light or dark? Did he have gold teeth? Teeth? What was his hair in dreadlocks or braids? We needed them to move beyond the generic black male description. But for the most part, the Asian woman couldn't move beyond it. Even with all the training, they were still unable to distinguish one black teenager's face from another. Ultimately, what did help put an end to the crime spree was technology. When cameras were placed outside the businesses that lined the busy streets of Chinatown, the risks of being caught suddenly shot up. The camera could capture what the woman could not. The boys knew the jig was up. Captain Armstrong's description of the situation led me to rem recall my own as a newcomer to Beechwood. I too tried to remember what's distinctive strategy and I failed and the Asian woman had failed despite our strong desire to get it right. The woman's inability to remember those black male faces went beyond awkward moments and insecurities about conversations held in hushed tones. Their inability to remember those faces stymied the police and spread fear across the Chinatown community for months and months before cameras were installed. These teenagers could rob them at will, even in broad daylight, and they needed no mask. Their face was their mask. Their race was their mask. Thank you. <laughs>